morning. Uh, we're incredibly thrilled to have, um, as I've already put it, superstar economists um, and the it couple of the world of economics. I don't know how much competition there is, um, <laughs> but even if there were a lot of yeah, competition, I'm sure that uh, you all would still win. Uh, so we have Justin Wolfers and Betsy Stevenson here. Um, They've, they've flown in from Michigan. They're both now economists and professors of public policy at the University of Michigan. They have all kinds of other affiliations with the Brookings Institution, with the um, with University of Pennsylvania, with Princeton, and uh, the National Bureau of Economic Research, and have done incredible work on, on marriage, on happiness within marriage, on uh, the way in which marriage uh, influences the economy and and also the way in which the economy and public policy influence behavior within marriage. We've talked today about specialization in marriage when one spouse you know, stays at home or is a secondary earner and one is the primary earner. And they've done all kinds of great work on um, economic forces. And so how we're responding as families to changes in the economy and to policy and, and, and how we're we're being shaped by those policies as well. So uh, just to continue the, the conversation from the last panel, um, so let's talk about marriage as an economic unit, marriage as an economic deal, say, between a man and a woman. I mean, that's what Simone de Beauvoir characterized marriage as this deal in which the man was a provider and, and the woman would bring any sorts of other, all sorts of other resources, um, childbearing services, housekeeping services, sexual services, and that was the fundamental deal of marriage and it's primarily an economic unit. Um, and so is that, is that true? You know, uh, Gary Becker won a Nobel Prize in economics for bringing economics outside of standard questions and into things like family behavior. And he started off by characterizing marriage as having enormous amounts of value because of the fact that people were more productive when they were in a marriage than when they were apart. So really giving the example, you know, just like Adam Smith talked about, you know, the um, the pin factory being more productive by, through specialization, he explained that families were more productive because they could engage in specialization. So if a, if a man and a woman were separate and they were trying to provide all the things for themselves separately, they would have less, uh, they would have less than if they did it together. And, and this was the, the big justification for marriage. And what we've seen over time is that benefit of marriage has been eroded, eroded enormously. And in fact, if that was really the only benefit of marriage, or if that was really where we still saw marriage today, I think we would have seen much bigger declines in marriage than we've actually seen. And so what we've argued instead is that marriage has really transformed from being about you know, producing more together uh, to something that's fundamentally different, which is enjoying a life more together. So we call that consumption complementarities. But it's about two people being together, getting more out of life because they're together, not necessarily producing more because they're together. I mean, to say that a little bit in English, what Betsy's <laughs> suggesting <laughs> is the radical idea that marriage has moved from fundamentally being about producing more stuff together. This new idea she called consumption complementarities, we sometimes call it hedonic marriage. It's actually just the idea that maybe it's about love. Um, and it's about enjoying doing stuff together. And so, you know, the economic toolkit, which often thinks about the production side of things, how we can do more together than we could do apart, um, we have to reshape that toolkit for thinking about what marriage is today. Um, it, it, another way of reframing everything Betsy just said, I think we agree on everything, um, is to suggest, and this is like a super economist way of looking at things, but it's not crazy when you think about it. Um, whenever we can achieve stuff through markets, we tend to do that, right? So I, you know, I just bought my lunch, I bought it from a restaurant. Um, I, I flew on a plane this morning, I, I bought that plane flight from US Airways. Um, and a lot of what marriage historically was doing was filling in for missing markets, stuff you couldn't buy. If you couldn't buy it, you had to produce it at home um, in, in, the, in the family factory. And so the stuff that the family factory used to produce would be stuff like um, you'd sew your children's clothes, you'd make dinner, um, Liza used the delicate term sexual services. Um, child care was also produced in the home. And what's changed is that the reach of the market has gone a lot deeper. So it used to be that my grandmother would uh, sew clothes for my mother. Um, and uh, so that was produced, clothes was something you'd produce in the family firm. 
um, in, in the natural seamstress, the, the person you'd hire would be the wife. Well, you know, dad went off, to, my grandfather went off to work. Um, today, the family firm, today, my family firm, we also, Betsy and I employ a seamstress, but it's, it's actually someone in China rather than being done within the family firm. And so what's happened is a lot of these markets, the reach of the market has, has substantially increased to the point that we buy our clothes, now it's much cheaper to buy them from China. Fresh food, um, it's much easier to just drop off at Trader Joe's than to have a family chef, um, which was previously would have been the wife's role. Um, we've also seen social, another important role of families was actually there wasn't a lot of social protection if you lost your job. For instance, it would, one of the functions of families was that uh, if, if I lost my job, hopefully my in-laws would help us out. Um, of course, with the rise of the welfare state, um, that's another role that was historically played by families that now is increasingly, th this isn't the reach of the market, now it's the reach of, of, of the welfare state, um, which has sort of crowded out some of the historic roles that, that families played. Well, let, let me interject with just a little bit of, of, I think, what the changes were. Because you, yeah. you started by saying missing markets, and then you gave some examples that I think to to a lot of people, wouldn't have, they wouldn't think the market was missing. Your grandmother yep. could have bought clothes if she had wanted to. So, um, you know, why is it that women thought it was a good deal to stay home and sew 50 years ago, and now, you know, sewing is a luxury thing to do because that it's very expensive to sew your own clothes compared to going to the store and buy them. And so, it's it's really this change. The change in trade has really um, had an enormous impact on families because it means that that you know you can find somebody who can make clothes much much more efficiently uh, than a stay-at-home spouse can and that's one of the reasons why you know we're trading with people all over the world and finding people who are focusing on what they can do most efficiently and that increase in trade has really uh, eroded a lot of the benefits of having a household specialist but it's not just the change in trade there's also been enormous technological changes. We take for granted when we go to the grocery store now that we might say, somebody says, you know, I'm going to make a cake. You know, when the last time you made a cake, how many of you started with flour, eggs, butter? You know, what, you, what most people do now is they go to the store and they buy a cake mix. So even when you're making a cake, you're starting with something that's been pre-done in the factory. Um, if you go back to, there was a grocery store that went in when these pre-made cakes were first introduced and asked women how many of them had ever made a, you know, a cake out of a box and you know, they found like 5% had. And now they went back in as part of some big anniversary in the last couple of years and asked women in the grocery store how many of them had made a cake from scratch. And they got about 5% mm, of them had ever made a cake from scratch. Right? So there's been this just enormous change in how we cook. And those changes, those technological changes, have also reduced the value of specialists. Because lots of people, even myself who never learned how to cook, can follow uh, the, you know, the directions on the back of a Trader Joe's box of boxed Indian food uh, to heat it up. I can follow the directions on a cake mix and usually not have it go flat. So you, you don't need as much of a specialist. I don't need to be making cake every week in order to turn out a reasonable cake once a year for my kid's birthday. Um, and the same thing's true with laundry. It actually used to be incredibly difficult to do laundry. And now it's really easy to do laundry. You can even put it all in together and put these color sheets in, right? So reds and whites can go together now. And so the, the, the need of having somebody who has the skills of a homemaker has really diminished over time. Yeah. But so the other way of saying what Betsy just said is housework became so simple that even a man could do it. <laughs> well, although, although what we see, I mean, now that more and more men are getting involved in kitchens and getting involved in cooking, is that kitchens are becoming incredible showcases for all sorts of tools. And you need your flamethrower for the creme brulee. And so um, it's, some people would argue that just as men started becoming more involved in domestic spaces, these domestic spaces became really nice. Uh, <laughs> um, well, well, let me give some data on that, just because you know, what we've seen, what's really interesting is that you know, over the last about 40 years, women's uh, production inside the home has fallen by nearly 13 hours a week, and men's has risen by nearly five. So that's a huge closing of the gap, right, and right. it's coming both from women doing less and men doing more. 
Right, right. But what's interesting to me about specialization, and it's interesting also how um, inflammatory a topic specialization is. That there, um, for example, I wrote in this Atlantic piece about same-sex relationships that a surprising percentage of same-sex couples with children will specialize, in that one person will be a non-earner and the other person will earn. Um, and, and, and immediately you start getting um, like blog posts saying, that's not true, that's not true, that's not, people don't specialize. It, it sort of has a bad name, I think, at least sort of um, liberal progressive uh, ideas about how family should work. But why do you think it is that in, in, a, in a kind of surprising percentage of same-sex couples, specialization does actually happen when children come into the equation? Well, let me say, I think every single household engages in specialization. Specialization doesn't have to mean one person stays home and one person works. The whole point we're saying is there's so much less to do in the household today that you don't need that kind of extreme specialization. In our household, we specialize. I do all the bills and all the taxes and uh, manage all the money. And I have no idea how much money I have. <laughs> <laughs> and Justin deals with hidden. all the technology, right? I can barely turn that. I go, every time I get on the treadmill, I'm like, how does this TV turn on again? <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we do specialize. I think right. every household right. does. It becomes right. much more complicated when you have, we have a three-year-old and an eight-month-old. Right. So then now you need a lot more household production. And some people, many people, are going to find that one person should be specializing in the three-year-old and the eight-month-old. And, and that's why you see people taking time out of the, the market. And you know, it comes with a lot of baggage, I think, for women. And maybe one of the things you see in, in same-sex couples is it doesn't come with quite as much baggage. Right, right. But the other thing is that I think people realize that it can be incredibly efficient to take that time out when you have small kids like I have if you're only looking at today. But if you actually look at what happens to your wages over the next 40 years, it's an incredibly costly thing to do. And a lot of people don't do that math. I'm sorry, what's costly to stay? To, stay? to take time out of the labor force. You never get those wages back. You, never will, you will never be at the same you know, place uh, at age 50 that you would have been if you hadn't come out of the labor force. Not only do you lose your wages those years, but you lose the gains. You come back in at a lower wage. And you're never going to reach the peak that you would have reached before, sort of no matter how hard you work. So the gains, the losses of staying home are not just the wages you give up today, but they're the promotions that you don't get in the future. And that's interesting because when I, when I interviewed you for the first time for my book, Betsy was in town. She was getting ready to start as a chief economist for the Department of Labor. And you had one young child at that point. And, and I know you were at, you were in, um, at Penn and the, you were taking care of the child. And Betsy had taken the train down and she had an interview that day. Uh, and, we were, and you were looking for your housing. So you were interviewing with me at the same time that you were looking at your housing and getting used to your neighborhood. And you had to get on the train to get back. And you're incredibly multitasking. But one of the things that we talked about was um, um, uh, and this, I think, plays into the work-family conversation that's going on uh, so widely now, is that when um, you were talking about a friend who, who felt like she wasn't making enough to justify the child care that she was going to have to pay in order to, uh, in order to continue working. And so she was thinking, maybe I should just stop working. Maybe I, it just, I, and, and I think women have this calculation much more than men do. Maybe because it's my salary, and so uh, if I'm not making enough. And your argument, which rings so true to me, um, and both Anne-Marie Slaughter and, and Cheryl Sandberg have made it, is that um, if you keep your foot in the door, even if it feels like you're not making enough to make it worthwhile, it will be worthwhile later if you think of your career as an investment. I think for a lot of women that's true. And, that, and for a lot of women, they are working for negative pay when they have those small kids. Right? If they stepped out of the labor force, particularly you know, married women, they stepped out of the labor force, they didn't pay the taxes, they didn't pay the costs associated with working, including child care. When they've got those small kids, you know, they would actually see their family income go up. Um, but they've got to take that dynamic approach to figure out whether it's a, a good choice or a bad choice. I think there's actually three components to that. So one is um, every year that you're in the workforce, you become a slightly better worker. Um, so that's maybe worth a couple of percent. We economists call that returns to experience. Every year you stay with your employer, you become better adept at navigating the internal bureaucracies and you become more effective within that firm. Um, we call that returns to tenure. Um, and so if you're not at work, you're not accumulating any of those. And that's worth maybe 5% of your salary, but it's worth that for the rest of your life. 
And then particularly for uh, very highly educated white collar jobs, there's this third issue, which I think is a signaling issue. There's no woman on partner track at a leading law firm or a woman on tenure track at um, a leading university who will feel comfortable getting pregnant before they've reached partner or tenure. And the problem is um, those who vote on these decisions see the choice to step out of the workforce as being a signal about your future commitment to the career. Um, if you're the type of woman who take time off, then you're also the type of woman who's not going to work too hard once we make you partner. Um, and as a result, um, women fear, I think rightly, that um, it's not a great decision before, it, stepping out of the workforce is not a great decision before others are going to make these sort of very large career decisions on your behalf. So it sounds like you all are arguing that specialization is still, is still a pretty fraught um, choice to make if you're, you're going to be this, the at-home person. So I think the way to think about this is, is that our life expectancy has increased so much that people have decades in the labor force. Right. And so when you step out, you're thinking about, you've got to think about what are going to be the effects of stepping out today for all your remaining time in the labor force. When women used to think about this, the vast majority of married couples had small children in, in their home. In 1880, 75% of married couples had children in the house. It's less than half today, in fact, I think it's about 40% of married couples have children in their home. So the majority of married couples don't have children, and that's, that's not because we aren't having kids. It's because you know, there's this period from becoming an adult at 20 to potentially working until you're 70, 75, that's 50, 55 right. years. Right. You look, ideally, it would be great to spend more time with your kids when they're you know, zero to eight. And by eight, it seems like they don't like you much anymore. Or they're not as interested in hanging out with you. The great thing about three is they really want to hang out with you. Right? So that's when you, really, that's when you want to be around. But you know, it, our, work for, our, our, our whole labor force is not very conducive to people who say, I'm going to take five years out. It's funny that when you say that, when you, when you talk about how long our careers are and how long life is, you'd think, well, why not then take three years out or five years out? Or I mean, <laughs> and I've heard uh, actually, I'm again, again with the same-sex um, reporting that I did, I was interviewing a lesbian couple, and and lesbian couples are less able to specialize because women's wages are lower, and so they're less able to afford just having one person work and the other person stay home. Um, but one of the women I was talking to said, if I could afford it, I would definitely stay home with my kids because what's three years? What's four years? Um, but you're saying that actually it's... The problem is when those three and four years are. You know, I, uh, I, I will tell you that... I, I do sometimes think it with glee. I hope that my daughter has children when I'm about 65 and I will happily retire and be her nanny. Right, right. <laughs> because, you know, you do, look, there is something joyful about staying home with kids. But it, it's really, when you're doing it at the peak of your career, it can be very costly. Hmm. I mean, the cost is, it's just the cost is greater because you're going to knock off your future wages for a heck of a lot longer than you once did. That's sort of the cost benefit. Here. And, right, and to put it right. in just in terms, it's a time where you're actually rapidly gaining experience. Right. When you're rapidly gaining those returns to tenure. And we also know that most wage gains come from actually changing jobs, getting an offer at a new firm. And those are, you know, new employer. Those offers tend to come most when you're at that age where people might want right. to take some time right. out. Betsy's idea is not crazy, by the way, which is um, from an income perspective, the right thing to do is stay home, but stay home with your grandchildren. Um, because you're harming the future career you're not going to have because you're <laughs> going to retire anyway. Um, actually, you see a lot of that in the African-American community. And in the, and in the Latino community yeah. as well, a lot of the women I and interviewed. So there's an open question as to whether we're going to see that become a more mainstream, hmm. uh, a more mainstream trend. Grandparents as the, uh, as the... I'm going to stay home. I'm just going to stay home in 30 years' time. <laughs> right, 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 right. That's interesting, yeah. Um, and so let's talk about, there's, there's uh, the Pew Research Center had um, this really fascinating report a couple of weeks ago about that 40% of mothers are the primary breadwinners in their households, which is incredibly significant. But Betsy, you and I have also talked about, regardless of whether or not women are breadwinners, they're, in, they're, they're contributing more than ever before in terms of family wages. I mean, contributing much more to the family um, uh, coffers than, than they ever have, and that that changes dynamics in, within marriage. And can you all talk about how that changes dynamics within, within marriage? Yeah, well, let, let's first talk about this sort of uh, what's been going on with marriages. And, and one of the reasons we're ending up with so many women who are out earning 
And, you know, really, uh, when we were talking about why marriage is changing, and, and one, of the, one of the implications of how marriage is changing is that it's become much more appealing for highly educated women, and it's become much less appealing for less educated women. So, you know, college educated women used to be the least likely to marry. If you look at women born in 1900, by age 50, 76% of the college educated women had married, compared to 90% of the high school graduates. That is now flipped on its head with the college graduate women who are more likely to marry. But it's not, it, it's, you, know, you, you hear these people say this is somehow because of the erosion of morals, perhaps, at the, among high school graduates. That's not what's going on at all. If you look, you see that it used to be the case that women who had a college degree were the majority of whom did not agree with the statement married people will be, marriage, married people are happier. The majority of women, college graduate women, did not agree with that. There was a huge gap. Most high school graduate women thought you'd be happy if you were married. Most college graduate women thought you wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And now, that's also flipped. Today, most college graduate women think you will be happy if you're married and, and less, <laughs> around a third only around a third of high school graduate women agree with that statement, that marriage, is, marriage makes people happy. So, so it's real change in, in how people perceive marriage and what marriage is doing for them has led to different types of people marrying. So let's just explore the logic of that. So if you're a college graduate woman 80 years ago, either you were useless or you thought marriage was useless. Um, because the standard role for a, a woman in, in marriage was to stay home wash, look after the kids, all the rest of this stuff. So you had no particular skills in that domain. So you weren't particularly marriageable from the husband's side. And um, from your own side, you had the ability to go out and earn your own income just fine. And so what he was offering in that deal wasn't that attractive either. Um, so that was sort of the old specialization-based model of marriage. The, what we think is happening is this movement towards what Betsy called hedonic marriage, I called love. Um, and this is when you enjoy spending time and money together. Well, who has time and money? Um, actually, it's those who are financially better off. And so this is part of the logic for why marriage has become a much more attractive form, forum for um, particularly well-educated women. Um, and working class women, instead of finding that you know, uh, they may not have the time and money to enjoy the partnership, and in fact, what they really don't want is yet another mouth to feed. Um, and so marriage then becomes somewhat less attractive to them. You know, when I first started studying economics, there's this like, classic um, st parable they talk about, about um, a husband and wife have to decide what to do on a Saturday night. The husband likes to go to the fight, the woman likes to go to the opera, and then they forget to plan, so they have to figure out where to go. And it's this little parable you learn. And what is funny about that parable is it describes a 1950s marriage. When men and women specialized, they also had very different interests. Yeah. So Justin's using this word love. Love has a lot of different definitions yeah. in the world. But what I really specifically mean is people who like to do the same stuff together. So a guy who likes to go to the fight is not marrying a woman today who likes to go to the opera. That is just not a good match. Because where, when a, a lot of the benefits from marriage are coming from doing stuff together that you enjoy doing. So two people who like the opera marry, and this comes back to the same, why same-sex marriages are also flourishing. Because marriage today is a place where the benefits come from finding somebody who is similar to you and enjoying the, the joint pursuits in life together, not somebody who's opposite to you who's going to compliment you on your weaknesses by being more productive together. Um, and this has led, you know, as we said, to more college-educated uh, women marrying. Now we've got to combine this with the other trend that's happening, which is college men used to outnumber women like two and a half to one, and now women outnumber college men like 1.4 to one. So we're having a real sea change in who the college graduates are in our society. And with women getting all those skills, they're going to get the wages. And that's going to change the dynamics. I just want to add, if anyone's interested in a great research topic, I mean, what's going to happen to the generation of college-educated women, which, have which in recent years, college-educated women marry college-educated men. There aren't that many college-educated men left. Um, so either standards are going to change, or an alternatively phrased, marriage is going to change, what, it is people, what people's understanding of marriage or we're going to see a very sharp decline in marriage among the highly educated. I don't have a clue what it is. I just think it's one of the more important 
social trends out there and there, there aren't enough people thinking about it. And the, this is a really big deal. You know, the unemployment rate in May, just this past month, for college graduates was 3.8%. 3.8%, right? For high school graduates, it was 7.4%. College graduates have jobs and they earn twice as much as high school graduates. So you've got them earning more, it's, it, and earning more when they're working and twice as likely to, to not be unemployed, so more likely to be at work. You know, it's, it's leading to very different types of families. And I, you know, I, I, said, I agree with Justin. I think what's gonna happen to the college graduate women who don't find college graduate husbands and how are those marriages gonna work? Um, are we gonna see men willing to and maybe we'll see a resurgence of specialization with men doing you know, more of the household tasks, or are we gonna see a group of women who have very unstable marriages? Or don't marry. Or don't marry. Right, yeah. right. Um, I, have to, I have to just read this. Uh, you, all, you all, since you're in Michigan, you might not have seen it, but over the, um, over the weekend, the Washington Post Outlook section ran this incredible letter. The Washington Post um, longtime restaurant reviewer, Phyllis Richmond, who's retired now um, and was looking through her, she was looking through some stuff in her basement and she found this letter when, in 1961 when she was a graduate of Brandeis and she was married and she applied to the graduate program in urban planning at Harvard. And she got a letter from a professor um, and he addressed her as Mrs. Alvin Richmond, Richmond, and he uh, and he said to speak directly. Our experience, even with brilliant students, has been that married women find it difficult to carry out worthwhile careers in planning, and hence tend to have some feeling of waste about the time and effort spent in professional education. This, of course, is true of almost all graduate professional studies. I never knew if he meant that all women who go into all studies feel a waste or that every graduate student feels like there's waste. But um, <laughs> he said, therefore, for your own benefit and to aid us in coming to a final decision, could you kindly write up a page or two at your earliest convenience indicating specifically how you might plan to combine a professional life in city planning with your responsibilities to your husband and a possible future family? And she never replied to that letter because she was so intimidated by being asked to justify how as a wife she could possibly make use of her graduate training. So, but she ended up writing this incredible letter now, 50 some years later, that said, well actually here's how I did it. And I had to follow my husband around and I wasn't able to go into urban planning, but I found that journalism and restaurant reviewing was something I could do at night. And I found college students who would watch my kids and they would live in the basement and, um, or the attic, and so I could get some time, and I just somehow made it work. But I was so intimidated by your letter that I never, uh, that I, ne I never went into that um, that career path. And she sent it to him, and he's still at Harvard. And he <laughs> wrote her back a letter, and it basically it didn't say I'm sorry, it didn't say I made a mistake. It said, well, you know, back then it actually was really hard for married women to have a career. And I was just, I was just struck by what, on so many levels, what a liability for a woman being married was in the 1960s. If you, I mean, she was a college-educated woman, but, but just in terms of having, it was just such a reminder of where the discouragement came from. And now um, it's, uh, uh, you know, just extraordinary how um, the relationship between marriage and sort of your economic prospects has changed. Yeah. I mean, it, we're still having a, a conversation, though, that, you know, I think the social change is still occurring because when I talk to people about work family, you hear people who, um, you know, who will recognize and who will talk about this is, is the only way we can really make fundamental changes is if this is a parent issue and not a women's issue. But, you know, too many times I hear people talk about it as a women's issue. And it's not a women's issue, it's a parent issue. And I, I feel like we just have not, we, we're not all the way from that letter that we need to go if we're going to have women play an equal role in the labor force. And I think when we look at the training that our women are getting, when we look at their completing college degrees at, at greater rates, they're getting better grades, they're coming out of college. You know, I, I told you the unemployment rate 
of, uh, of college uh, graduates, that's the total unemployment rate for all college graduates. If you look at recent college graduates, the unemployment rate's much higher, but I'll tell you something that's really shocking. For recent college graduates, the unemployment rate was 16.1% for men and 11.2% for women. Really? So those women are graduating college and they're diligently looking for their jobs. Women are really pursuing things. These young women, they're pursuing it in high school, they're pursuing it in college, and apparently they're pursuing those jobs as soon as they graduate. We can't afford to ostracize them from our labor market. We're investing too much in them. Right, right. And it, in order to make sure that our labor market is as productive as it can be, we're going to have to make sure that we have a plan in place to keep them active. And I think one of those plans is going to have to be recognizing that work family is a parent issue, not a women's issue. I think um, if you look at the, how women are doing in college, you know, grades, college completion rates. Betsy just talked about employment as well. I can imagine Betsy writing the equivalent letter today. Um, Dear sir, it's come to our attention that you're a man. Um, there is a big puzzle. What's going on with young men? Right. Um, you, you know, it, uh, we find that male right. college students right. <laughs> don't, don't, don't use their <laughs> drink a lot, drink. Their effort. drop out, and don't work. Right. Um, right. So could you justify your interest in pursuing graduate studies with yeah. us? Yes. <laughs> I think mildly more seriously, um, you talked about that letter, the marker there was that that woman was married. Right. I think the marker today is probably children. Um, mm -hmm. so, and I'm gonna take, right. I'm gonna take right. the field I know best, which is academic economics. And if you asked me the leading 20 female economists in the world, I would guess half to two thirds are childless. Mm -hmm. um, and again, somehow this is a marker of something, I'm not quite sure what. Um, but uh, I certainly, I, I, I think there are still pretty big issues about how parenthood, but motherhood, motherhood, I mean motherhood here, how motherhood is perceived in the labor market. Is perceived, right. Yeah. right. I, I will, you know, I do think we've come out of a time where, um, you know, women still did try to pretend there were no differences. And, you know, I, I went to a conference and gave a talk when my now son was, He's, still, he's going to be a son a long time. No, 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 when, I, when my, son, my son was like maybe eight weeks, maybe 12 weeks, really early on. And so he was really on the breast. And I was giving a talk for Claudia Golden, who is like one of the most amazing yeah. scholars of yeah. women's labor force participation. And Claudia knows that I'm coming with this, that, that I'm going to give this talk at, at her um, big event and that I've got this new baby. And she emails me and she says, bring your baby. You should bring your baby. And so I did. I brought my baby, and I breastfed in the back of the, the conference room. And a woman who's about a decade older than me was horrified <laughs> that I would actually, I was like, I've got a little apron thing. You can't see anything, but you know, I, I got to walk out. I can't listen to the conference. If I've got to breastfeed every two hours, I'm going to be in and out, in and out, up to my hotel room. And um, I think the, I am a very uh, aggressively out <laughs> breastfeeder. And I, I think that uh, that's a real change. I think, you know, and that, but I think that that's part of what we have to do because I think there's too many women who didn't want to acknowledge the, 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 bur the I don't know if you'll call them burdens, but the, the realities of having a newborn. And I think we, we, know, we, need to, we need to have public policy that accommodates them. And, you know, it's one of, I think, the greatest things in the Obama health care law was the, Paid, uh, or not paid, sorry, I shouldn't say paid, it's not paid, but the, the break, the required break for nursing moms where they have to be provided a room, it cannot be a bathroom, and they must be provided the breaks to express milk. And, and that's revolutionary in our country. So let me um, ask for questions now. I think we've got about uh, 10 minutes, so we'd love to have some questions. Uh, yeah, the first one that went up was um, in the beige shirt halfway back. Do you mean like going part time or yeah? Mm -hmm. So uh, I haven't done any Just of this work, check. but it, it's actually really hard to look at what are the causal effects. So we can look at on average what happens to women, but what we you know that really mixes up what 
that, you know, types of people are willing to go part-time, what types of people are willing to step out, what types of people go full steam ahead. Um, there was a really nice paper um, that I saw where what they did was actually looked at how long it took people to get pregnant and was looking at, you know, sort of how much career experience had they had before they had a baby based on this phenomenon, which is still the fact that we can't perfectly plan our pregnancies. And really saw that just the act of being able to, just, the, just having your pregnancy delayed led to big gains in your wages looking 20 or 30 years later. And, and that's, uh, that, would bring, that, would, that effect would put it all together. That would put us together, the people stepping out as well as the people going part time. Meaning that the, the, the older you were when you had your child, the better you did wage wise? Yeah, the better, the, because basically what, you, when you have your kid, the higher you are on sort of that oh. wage curve as you're getting these gains in your wage from more and more experience, the higher you are on that when you have your first kid, the higher you're likely to rise. Oh, uh, so, I, no, I just, want to, so I just want to add something which is, surely it depends, it varies a lot across occupations. So you're talking about rather than stepping out, powering down for a little bit. And the way we organize different occupations, you know, I'm told you can't be a law partner unless you're working 100 hours a week. And surgery, knife before wife, you can't be a surgeon unless you're always on call. But somehow vets can do it and somehow obstetricians can do it. Um, and I'm not quite sure I understand what it is that flips these uh, occupations. But um, if you look at how um, obstetrics is organized, um, it shows that a lot of occupations where we previously thought you had to be 100% on 100% of the time, just turns out that's just not true. Um, and we can reorganize work in a way that um, allows people to be part-time or work family-friendly hours, things like that. Yeah, I should say, I, I was thinking about that. This work by Claudia Golden and Marianne Bertrand, and they look at occupations, and it does, women do tend to gravitate towards occupations where the hit from from either taking time out or just reducing your hours is much lower on your wages. So I, I think for a lot of people used to think that veterinary medicine has become almost 100% women because animals are cute and fuzzy and it's no longer about cows, it's about cats. But actually it's because you can work at 80% and you get 80% of the wages, uh, whereas in lots of occupations you go to 80% and you are lucky to get 30% of the wages. And because, stand because emergency facilities are now standalone. So if you're going to be doing vet work in the middle of the night, it's going to be a different facility, and you're not necessarily. Um, more questions? Uh, yes, right there on the aisle in the blue plaid shirt. Sorry. It doesn't actually seem to be working. Can you hear me now? All right, yeah. cool. Um, you know, what, uh, what those types of trends have for the overall, uh, I guess, egalitarian nature of society and, you know, globally, like, um, you know, a lot of these things are now being made in China, you know, in like a Foxconn, you know, uh, factory, in a Bangladeshi factory that, you know, just collapsed a couple days ago. So it's like, you know, here in America and in our interpersonal relationships, we maybe benefiting from this more egalitarian spirit of interpersonal connections, but what are the broader social you know, egalitarian like implications of you know, the rise of or change in dynamics of interpersonal relationships? Yeah, um, so the difference between my grandmother's household and mine is my grandmother would sew clothes and then my mother would wear them. In ours, we go to the store and we buy them made in China. Um, what that's done is it's freed up Betsy to live an enormously more interesting professional life than my grandmother had. Um, and it means that a family in China now uh, isn't hungry. Um, I understand this is a controversial claim, 
Um, but economic development in China has reduced the number of people living under $2 a day from 80% to below 10%. Um, so I think this is one of the most egalitarian things that I can do. I, I, uh, I, so economists often have strong views on trade. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look, but um, I, the, the alternative is I can leave someone unemployed. I'm not forcing anyone to work in a factory. I'm, giving, I'm offering them the opportunity to move off their family farm where they face the possibility of hunger to moving to the city and working in the factory. And I'm offering them the, the choice, and the person who thinks that's exploitation won't offer them that choice. And I think it's on their conscience if, if those people end up unhealthy, if their children end up dying in the, in the fields. I think that um, you know, it, we, economists tend to really want to pursue efficiency gains. And, and these increases in trade have definitely increased you know, world output. Everybody um, has gotten more. But it is, you know, we should think about how then, if the, the pie got bigger for the whole world, how is the pie being divvied up? Those can be very separate questions. Um, and I think you know, Justin's strongly saying, don't, don't you know, advocate for things that would make the pie shrink. Uh, we need to keep the pie big. But I think we can ask the separate questions, which is, are there better ways to divide it? Uh, but I don't think that keeping women in the home is the way to help get those slices more evenly divided. Yeah, so I think we'll also just, if, if um, both of you, um, starting with the gentleman in the tie and then the woman in the gray sweater, just state your, your comments or your questions. And then if we have time, we'll, we'll field them. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I, I heard this story about two economists, and I'm not entirely sure if it's true, that were walking through um, the Swiss Alps. And they were looking at some family farms where there were some potatoes being grown. And you know, one economist turns to the other and says, this is a very inefficient way to grow potatoes. You, know, you could do it a lot better than this. And the other economist looks, looks back at him and says, you're right, but this is a very efficient way to grow people. In, in other words, that there's sort of non-pecuniary benefits to certain kind of family structures. And you've talked about how there's been sort of changes in the goods that are provided by marriage, um, you know, so that no longer is marriage providing the sewing and, and, you know, these sorts of things. And it's just sort of reduced now to, you know, doing things that you like to do together. Are there also non-pecuniary costs to that? And has there been some study on that that you'd be willing to comment on? Okay, so we'll take the... Um the next question, and then hopefully we can have a chance to respond. Um, I think your the the uh, portrait you've uh, portrayed of marriages, especially middle class marriages, is a little um, it's 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 somewhat um, inaccurate. That is, a lot of middle class families don't just divide. It's not just one person works and one person stays home. What in fact happens is to achieve work family balance, they hire someone else. And this goes back to the question that this other person raised. A lot of the people that they're hiring, because America has a complete, almost near complete lack of socialized things like childcare and elder elder care and and after school care, we hire we hire foreign people. In other words, it's not just migrant labor. It's not just foreign labor doing labor in their home countries. It's foreign labor coming here. Women, especially, migrating, leaving their own children behind, to you know, with with dubious arrangements, uh, so that they can that so that they can um, pour love into our children. And, and you know, and this is a this is a global imbalance that I think really needs to be addressed. Maybe some of it is going to be addressed in the immigration bill if it ever passes and, and some of these women are able to migrate legally, which will undoubtedly uh, improve their situations. But I think it's really important. I mean, most of the families you've talked about are middle class families. And I think it's really important to think about the, the, the uh, position of working class families in terms of care work. It's really, that's really one of the things that can be marketized. But when it is, it's, it's really complicated and often un, very unequal. So did you I, want to respond? Yeah, I want to dispel one myth because people have this fantasy of, you know, sort of like the 1960s, 1950s marriages where the woman stayed home and took care of the kids, that the kids got all this time with their parents. Kids, parents spend more time with their kids today than they did back then, both moms and dads. And, um, and it, it's more true the gains in time with kids has been even greater among highly educated women who are even more firmly entrenched in their careers. And what we see is parents are spending more time with their kids. So there's more actual family time where that's mom plus dad plus kid. Um, so I don't think that we've necessarily sacrificed um, some idyllic vision of parents spending time with their kids. 
I'll take a quick bite at the other question, which was about non-pecuniary costs of changing marriage, which is simply to say I think you're asking exactly the right question. When economists think about this stuff, we aren't just thinking about dollars and cents. Um, we are trying to think about the full range of things. And what we've described is the ways in which marriage is adapted to the changing economy. Um, I think the rest of the whole vibrant debate that exists around marriage is very much about you know, what are these non-pecuniary costs and benefits. Um, the only note, uh, and this would be things like you know, how well are we doing raising our children? Um, and I, the only thing I'd note is I'm struck by how little we still know despite the fact that it's a vitally important and interesting question. Well, thank you so much. This has been fabulous. You've been just a great audience. Thank you. Thank you for staying all afternoon and spending your afternoon with us. We've really enjoyed it. Thank you.